Welcome to my talk, Bargaining to Group Consensus. My name is Robert Williams. I work at the University of Leeds, and um, I want to thank my funders, first and foremost, uh, the European Research Council, who fund um, uh, the project Group Thinking at the University of Leeds. Details on the first slide there. Right, so um, what I'm going to do in this talk is start by telling you a bit about accuracy first epistemology, something that's been kind of a, a hot topic in the literature on individual rational belief philosophy of um, for the last decade. So I'm going to characterize some of the resources from there. And then I'm going to uh, also put on the table a bit of bargaining theory from social choice theory. And then I'm going to mush these th two things together in the hope of giving a sort of an accuracy first um, account of uh, how to resolve a bargaining problem that involves picking a credence for an agent. And the, the case I'll give is the credence of, of an Android we're creating. And then towards the end, I'm going to link that to um, um, uh, conditions for forming group beliefs and compare a little to the rest of the literature. So let's get on. All right. So first of all, um, to introduce the notion of accuracy. So we've got this agent Sally. She's got 0.4 credence in P. We want to um, have some kind of take on how accurate this credence is. Um, so a few things about this. It's more accurate if P is false than if P is true. It would be even more accurate given that P is false if it was closer to zero. So here's a very natural proposal. We're going to measure inaccuracy by some increasing function of the distance between the credence and the actual truth value, where the truth value is one if the proposition is true and zero if false. So here's Richard Pettigrew's framework from his book Accuracy and Laws of Credence. We think we've got, uh, and we help ourselves to a notion of similarity between creedal states, where uh, that's the inverse of dissimilarity, where dissimilarity is given by the square Euclidean distance. Like, take two credences in a proposition, take their difference and square it. And if you want to do that for a whole credence function and have a measure of dissimilarity for that, you average over all the propositions just that way. And then ideal credences in a given world will just match the truth values one in truths, zero in falsehoods. Inaccuracy then is the dissimilarity from the ideal. So uh, we get this characterization of inaccuracy that I've called Briar 1, Briar 2. Uh, the inaccuracy of uh, a credence in P will be uh, the square distance of that credence from the actual truth value. And to get that for a whole credence function, you just average overall propositions. All right. So. That's a pretty um, simple proposal for a measure of accuracy. Okay, why are people excited about this? Well, um, it's all based around, kicked off by this theorem. Um, so this gives you a characterization of um, when credences uh, can be probabilistic. Credal state is probabilistic uh, in the standard sense, satisfies the laws of probability, if and only if, there's no probabilistic belief state C such that no matter which world is actual, C is more accurate than B. So basically, if you violate the axioms of probability, then there's going to be another possible creedal state that you could be having that is guaranteed to be more accurate than you are. And that looks like a flaw. And so that looks like it explains one sense in which violating the axioms of probability might be a bad thing to do. Okay, so this formal result is used, uh, argued to be a foundational alethic argument for probabilism, uh, for probability theory being a rational requirement on credence. And this result follows if we, uh, can be proven to be the case, if we use that, uh, uh, that Briar score that I mentioned in the first slide, that is the square you Euclidean distance measure of creedal similarity. All right. So that was kind of, that's bit of machinery one. Now I'm going to move to bit of machinery two, which is 
bargaining theory. So um, just to have a case on the table, you and I say want to both get the house made ready for a party. There's too much for one person to do. So we need to agree some division of labor. And there are many possible divisions of labor that are better by each of our lights than not having a party at all. I could do most of the work, you could do most of the work, we could split it evenly. No matter how it gets done, we want the party. Um, but how do we divide labor? What principal choice can we make here, given we've got both common interests, we prefer any of these divisions of labor over not having a party at all, but we also have conflicting interests within that, we'd rather do less. Um, each of us holds a kind of threat of veto. We could just walk away, um, you know, threatening the other with something they don't want, although it's something that we'd rather not do ourselves. So this is a bargaining situation. And it's modeled in social choice theory in the following kind of way. So we've got two agents, say, it's kind of a special case, and a space of possible agreements between them. It's formal conditions on that set. I won't talk about that. Each agent then is supposed to assign a specific utility to each agreement. And um, it's an important technical part of this proof that the utilities are assumed here to be interpersonally incomparable. There is no meaningful comparison between how high my utility is for something and how high yours is. There's also this special outcome disagreement, which is assigned a utility by each agent as well. And we insist for non-triviality that there's at least one agreement that is better by oath our lights, utility dominates that disagreement state. So we don't want to be in the disagreement state. So that's like not having the party. So Nash's, well, what Nash does at this point is he um, characterized, he set down three conditions that he suggested were um, conditions that a solution to the bargaining problem should meet, uh, what a good compromise should be. Okay, uh, the details don't matter over much because I'm just going to suppose them and move on, but just to briefly run through them, the first condition is really quite sensible. Weak Pareto says that if something's going to be a solution, there's got to be no alternative to it that has greater utility for everyone. Otherwise, why the hell would you go for the solution rather than the better one? That doesn't look like a good compromise. It looks like you should move to the next one. The second condition is invariance under contraction. And what this says is, if you've got this bargaining problem and you've got a solution to it, and then and you've got another bargaining problem, which differs from the first just by throwing away some options that didn't include the solution, then the solution's still good. Okay, so you don't change your solution by throwing away some options unless they include it itself. And the third one is really the substantive one here. Um, no asymmetry out without asymmetry in. And effectively, that says is if you can find a representation of the bargaining problem where everyone's utility for the disagreement state, D, is the same, and it's always like nobody's got any options that other people don't have, that's just kind of invariant under permutations. If I've got an option that gives me two and gives you one, and there's also one that gives you two and me one, if it's symmetrical like that, no, nobody's got any leverage over anybody else, then you're going to get to a solution where everybody gets the same utility. All right. So um, that kind of egalitarian condition is going to do a lot of heavy lifting in the formal proof, which I'm not going to go through here. I'm just going to state the results. So here's the results. Nash showed that there's always exactly one agreement in this space of possible agreements that satisfies his three conditions. And you can characterize it as that agreement that maximizes the following product, where the product is like the utility of your candidate solution for agent one minus the utility of the disagreeing state for the agent one multiplied by the same thing, but for agent two. So we want to get that as high as possible. And when you get it as high as possible, you find the, a unique thing there. And that's the unique solution that meets the Nash conditions. So if you thought the Nash conditions were sensible, if we'd signed up to them, this gives, it, gives us the recipe for um, actually finding what they tell us to do. OK, so that's kind of fun. OK, so having our two pieces of equipment on the table, the accuracy idea and the um, and the bargaining idea, let's mush them together. 
now we're going to be bargaining not over first order things like um, who gets to do the tidying up and whether we get the party, we're going to be bargaining over a belief state. So let's suppose that you and I were um, building an Android, we'd done all the big work, all we have to do now is program in its credences. Um, the disagreement outcome here is that um, the Android doesn't get built at all. So the Android not being built, that's what happens if we can't agree. Uh, the other possible outcomes here, uh, the Android has some specific set of credence C for all sorts of choices of C. We suppose there are some credences we'd each prefer over there being no Android. So this makes it a bargaining situation. And now we bring in some ideas from the accuracy literature. So we, for this to be a bargaining situation, we need to assign utilities to each of these possible agreements. And uh, let's assume that each of us wants the Android to have credences as similar as possible to their own. But we had a measure of similarity between creedal states that we used in the uh, initial uh, characterization of accuracy. If you remember it, that's what squared Euclidean distance was. So this motivates a uh, 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 definition saying the utility of a candidate Android credence C for someone with creedal state B is one minus the squared Euclidean distance between those two creedal states. And you average that over all propositions. And that'll be a characterization of utility up to affine transformations. Because remember, we were, we were uh, assuming that the utilities weren't going to be comparable. So we're not going to pin them down to exact real numbers. Each person, it's kind of, you can boost it in various ways. All right. And one thing here to note is that uh, if we hold fix what B is, caring about similarity to yourself like this and fixing your utilities in that way is exactly the same as wanting the Android to be accurate and fixing the utility of a creedal state to program into that Android by the expected accuracy of that state. Again, modulo affine transformations. Okay. So that's not an immediately transparent equivalence there, but it's kind of really interesting one and uh, one I'm happy to talk about in Q&A if anybody is interested. Okay, so you're caring about accuracy or equivalently caring about the similarity of the, the Android's credence to your own. Okay, so this gives rise to conflicts between uh, the two agents who are picking the Android and programming the, the Android's credence in together. So simplest possible illustration of this, um, suppose we're trying to fix the Android's credence in a single proposition P, maybe it's swans are dangerous. And say my credence in this is 0.9, your credence in it is 0.3, so you're a bit bolder than I am. The utility of the Android having credence X in P for me is the measure of the similarity between that credence and my own, and that on the way we're measuring it is 0.9 minus X squared. And the utility of the Android having that credence for you is going to be 0.3 minus x squared. So you can see this conflict because as we consider the various candidates, as they get nearer and nearer to nine from the middle, then I get happier and happier with them and you get sadder and sadder and vice versa. Okay. So the Android construction problem is just like the party preparation problem. We have a range of outcomes which both agree are better than the default, that we've got conflict of interest among those about which to pick, we've got the threat of veto, we could not have the party or we could walk away from building the Android, we don't want to do that. And Nash's result therefore applies, there's a unique Android credence that relative to our epistemic utilities over possible Android credences satisfies the Nash conditions. And that's going to be, we'll just read that across from the bargaining literature, that'll be the one that maximizes the product of the difference of utilities in the Android having credences C from the utilities in the no Android that we attach to the no Android default. All right. And we can write that down. So the Nash solution applied to this case, the one proposition problem is that credence X, which maximizes the product that I've written down there, right? So 0.9 minus x squared minus d1, 0.3 
minus x squared minus d2, where d1 and d2 are the utilities of the no Android for you, the no Android situation outcome for you and for me, respectively, respectively. Actually, for me and for you, respectively. So look, the point is that if you plug in particular numbers for d1 and d2 there, you've got a quartic polynomial written down and we can just do some maths to figure out what that tells us to do. And indeed on a blog post that I've given you the reference of here, I do the maths. I kind of plugged it into Wolfram Alpha on the internet and did some curve sketching and figured out what the answer was. And here's, I'm not going to walk through all of that stuff, it would be too painful, but I'm going to report the conclusions of that. So the Nash compromise in this case will be the arithmetical average of the agent's credences when the utility of no Android is the same for both parties. Okay, so if you plug in D1 and D2 being the same, then it spits out that you want the linear average of the two. When the utility of no Android is greater one party than the other, the compromise uh, that's predicted by the Nash thing is not linear pooling on. It's not this straight unweighted average, but it's closer to the credence of the agent who has less to lose, who, um, you know, who likes, who doesn't mind having no Android more than the other. And that's an interesting pair of results. Basically, what this shows is that the Nash recipe is distinct from other very popular credence pooling recipes. For example, aggregate by unweighted arithmetical averaging or aggregate by geometrical averaging. Though it has the former thing as a limiting case, right? So like I said, that when you've got the kind of default being equal, then we get out something like linear averaging um, there. Again, one thing I want to say here is like all of the, these kind of results are framed in terms of saying the utility of the no and Android outcome is the same for both parties. That looks like an interpersonal utility comparison. And I said, we shouldn't be doing that kind of thing. But that can be paraphrased away. Happy to talk about that in Q&A if you're worried about that. But it all makes sense, trust me. Okay. So I've been talking about Androids at a social ontology conference, we want to transfer this now to the case of group beliefs. And now, if we're talking about aggregation in the context of group beliefs, normally we'd be thinking about a kind of deflationary account where we'd be analyzing group belief in terms of like, you know, what it is for the group to believe this is for certain aggregate, that to be the product of a certain aggregation. We're not going there. That's not well, the link I want to draw. I want to um, link it to a much more inflationary account of group belief, because I think those inflationary accounts pattern-like are analogs of the Android problem. So consider the Gilbert-style inflationary accounts of group belief, degree of belief that I've just set out here. So for a group to have credence X in P is for group members to be jointly committed to emulating other body, an agent who's got credence X in P. And they are jointly committed in this way just when they each openly express willingness to be jointly committed. So basically, there's a condition that each member must meet, and if they meet that condition, openly expressing da-da-da, then a group credence comes into existence. So if two people have the chance to form a Gilbertian group credence, if they don't both express willingness, there'll be no group credence, that's the analogue of the no android. And if they each prefer a range of group degrees of belief in P to no group belief at all, there'll be a bargaining situation about which degree of belief to all openly express commitment to. And so what I'm thinking is like, this just is the Android problem all over again. And indeed, you don't have to have the Gilbert uh, inflationary account to set this up. Other inflationary accounts, you can set up the same sort of thing. So this really is all the kind of the Nash bargaining stuff that I've been doing can be applied directly to this case as well. So just to um, round out this paper, last slide, um, I wanted to just compare and contrast what I'm doing to another um, couple of papers from Richard Pettigrew that is in broadly in this tradition. He's linked accuracy first epistemology to aggregating credence by some of the things I've been talking about, linear pooling, geometrical pooling. Um, relationships between this 
He's presupposing interpersonal comparability of epistemic utility, as far as I can see. And I say the Nash thing rests on the opposite assumption. The Nash approach that I've been doing factors in walking away into the choice, whereas in the pedigree framework that doesn't occur. Nash gives even weight linear pooling or uh, as a special case where the, the, the utilities of the default states are the same. It would be interesting to know whether uh, uneven weight linear pooling can capture the rest of the cases where you've got uneven utilities for the disagreement. That's a matter for future research. And finally, um, Pettigrew has got this really fascinating thing where he feeds into his um, constraints on aggregating credences, other accuracy methods and ones not based on SED, but on something else. And this raises the question, what happens if you put those other um, inaccuracy measures into the framework of this paper, the Nash bargaining stuff? And don't know what happens there, but it would be really interesting to find out. So that's everything I've got.